Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Dr. Armin Moss from Washington State University is one of the most well-respected scholars in all of Mormon studies. In our final conversation with Dr. Matt Harris and Dr. Newell Bringhurst, they will talk about Armin's contributions to the conclusion of the Gospel Topics series book and also discuss their feelings about Dr. Moss. I'm really sad that uh, Armand wasn't able to be on our podcast, and it's a, it's a big loss for Gospel Tangents. But hopefully you'll get to know what a wonderful scholar Armand was. Check out our conversation. I don't, I don't want to give away all of the book, uh, I, but we've got some really interesting stuff going on here. I would like to talk a little bit about um, Armand Moss, who just recently passed away. Um, can you guys share a little bit about what Armand said to, to kind of close up the book? Uh, yeah, I, I, I thought that uh, that essay is really one of the critical essays. If I was going to recommend uh, the way you read the book, I would, I would recommend uh, reading uh, the introduction that Matt and I wrote and then going to uh, read what uh, Armin Moss had to say in his, uh, in his concluding essay, because what that does is it really does two critical things. It, it kind of summarizes the gist of what's in most of the essays so that if you, read, if, you read, if you read that second, you'd be able to go back and read the, each of the uh, you know, subsequent you know, uh, essays themselves. And, and he does really a good job of, of, of summarizing the gist of what each of the authors mean and, and how, they, how they approached it. And, uh, and, and so I think that's one of the great contributions of his uh, essay. But I thought one of the most profound things that, uh, that Armin had to say in his, uh, his uh, essay, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to look through my notes because I, I thought it was so so uh, kind of profound that it, it, uh, it, it, it stood out at me, uh, uh, was uh, he talks about, uh, there's a section of his, of, of his uh, commentary where he talks about the evolution of church uh, doctrines and categories of church doctrine. He, he, he breaks it down. I think he's written this in other, other contexts, but he says that uh, when you're dealing with the issue of church doctrines, and how they change, they tend to fall in four, uh, you know, four categories. Canonical, which is the highest level, things that really are, are, are very strong and basic to, to essential Mormonism. What are called official, which is a second category. The third category being authoritative. And then uh, uh, the lowest category, what he calls folklore. And uh, it, it's interesting because he does say that the, the evolution, you know, uh, like the black priesthood uh, and temple restriction kind of went through all four of these categories. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, virt- I don't know if he, he, he says, you know, it starts out as folklore and then it evolves into authoritative. You know when 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 Joseph, when Brigham Young uh, you know issues uh, saying blacks can all, uh, authoritative uh, official when it's saying blacks can no longer uh, hold the priesthood and then it almost reaches a canonical uh, category when the church issues its official uh, uh, statements first in 1949 which really gives it the imprimatur of the first presidency and it, and and it's really enforced I mean people who who question it or or try to change it are, are are really dealt with harshly, you know, really from that point on. Before it 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 doesn't have that canonical uh, category, and so uh, you know that. So he 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 discusses that in this uh, concluding essay, and then he also deals with what uh, uh, what he calls issues of doctrinal innovation. For instance, he, he looks at the essay that uh, was written on the mother in heaven. Initially, that was a taboo to even talk about, uh, you know, a mother in heaven. I mean, that was one of the things that got people like Margaret Toscano and others, you know, when they did the purge in the early 90s, you know, all those women were talking about uh, female feminist issues, including mother in heaven. And there was a, an explicit ban at that time that you do not 
you know, that's not even brought up as an issue. But the fact that, uh, that uh, the church has issued a mother in heaven uh, uh, essay has uh, removed that taboo and perhaps moved it in, you know, from maybe what have been the folklore, or, or, you know, uh, an official category. But yet it's still kind of tricky because uh, the church is very uncomfortable about the idea of, you know, you know uh, uh, talking excessively and in detail uh, uh, about mother in heaven. So he, he talks about the idea of, uh, of, of, of doctrinal uh, innovation as reflected in some of the essays, particularly the mother in heaven essay. And then uh, even in the Bloomberg uh, essay, he makes reference to the fact that uh, uh, the church has, uh, has kind of moved in what one, I think it was one writer named White who talked about a neo-orthodoxy of the church, giving increased emphasis to the idea of grace works and uh, the sufficiency of the atonement, which uh, Bloomberg, you know, discusses in his essay. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, and then he also deals with the issue of, uh, of ambiguity. What did Joseph Smith really mean when he wrote about women's role in the priesthood? And, and that was an issue that, uh, that Margaret Toscano uh, tackles in the, uh, you know, and I think you'll find your interview with her quite interesting how she'll, she'll handle that. I'm sure she'll have some really interesting things to say about what did Joseph Smith really mean when he talks about the women's role in the priesthood. And, and Margaret is absolutely convinced that he intended that the Relief Society would be another priesthood quorum, just as the, uh, uh, the quorum of the anointed. He claims that Margaret, uh, you know, uh, uh, claims or, or, and others have written that the Quorum of the Anointed was considered as a priesthood quorum. And that was a quorum that included both men and women. So she's effectively arguing that women <laughs> held uh, the priesthood. So, you know, as I say, um, Armand has some really fascinating things to say uh, uh, about, uh, you know, the way he, uh, summarizes and encapsulations the significance of the uh, of, of of the gospel topics essays and what they portend for you know doesn't doesn't go into it too much what it, what it maybe portends for the future of the church. Cool. Do you have anything else, Matt, on on Armin Moss and the and the conclusion there? No, Noel summarized it nicely. Just I'd say one thing about Armin the person though is that I think that there isn't probably anybody in the church, in my opinion, who represents a um, honesty and truthfulness, and but yet from a believing Latter-day Saint as Armin. He really has walked that balance his entire life. He's not afraid of the truth. He's not afraid to uh, let the chips fall where they may. But as a believing, practicing Mormon, um, I always, I loved his scholarship because I knew that he wasn't an apologist. I knew that he wasn't going to um, whitewash, you know, race or anything else he wrote about. And he was always going to do it in a very sensitive uh, way that I think is really what should be expected of each of us who, who writes on Mormon studies. And I, I really think he's a model of a believer, but also a scholar. And that's one of the reasons why Newell and I wanted him to participate in this volume is because he really did have that, that balance and um, he's going to be missed. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. He was, I, I consider him to have been a personal mentor to me because he carefully critiqued and uh, uh, went over with me. And we had a lot of lively discussions on uh, the issue of blacks and the priesthood because along with Lester Bush, Armin was one of the pioneer writers on the issue of race uh, priesthood. His first article appeared before uh, Lester Bush's did back in back in the 1970s, 70, uh, uh, or 67. It was a, a dialogue article on race, folklore, and and, and the priesthood. He, he so he talks a little bit about how uh, how it started out as folklore. You know that 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 was his 
his, uh, you know, initial foray. And then, of course, all of Abraham's children. And then he and Lester Bush uh, co-edited uh, an anthology, which included one of my essays in there on uh, that was published in in the early 1980s. Neither white nor Matt's, black. There it is. That's right holding there. it up. I don't know if we can see it, but hopefully. You yeah, can. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Neither white nor black. And uh, and and so, uh, you know, he continued to write on the issue. And then, you know, he, the fading of the Pharaoh's curse is another very seminal article where he further argues about this evolution going from folklore uh, uh, to uh, to doctrine, you know, to a can canonical. Uh, I mean, you you have to you have to, uh, you know, you have to acknowledge the fact that it that that the black that uh, black priesthood denial reached the canonical status with the 49th statement. And then it's almost like they immediately regretted it because <laughs> come, here comes David O. McKay saying, oh my gosh, I signed this statement back in 49 and they tried to downplay that they'd even, that statement even existed as, as Matt has shown in the stuff that he's written. I mean, it was, you know, they, they, they give it that status and then almost immediately uh, when, when David O. takes over, David O. McKay takes over in 51, he said, oh, my gosh, look what we're stuck with. We're stuck with this damn albatross, you know. <laughs> and, and I think that's what he, you know, uh, almost, at, at, you know, David o. McKay is another complex individual. I, I, I had the opportunity to get to know the McKay family uh, quite intimately when I was doing my biography of Fawn Brody, who, of course, oh, wow. was McKay's uh, errant niece. So, right. you know, they're an interesting family, uh, you know, kind of have some of the same complexities and contradictions that you find with Dallin Oaks. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, the last thing I'd like to talk about, I know you guys are both still writing books. Um and uh, in fact, let me just mention this really quickly. Just a couple of days ago, I got a copy of Matt's latest book on Ezra Taft Benson. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And the making of the Mormon Rite. I haven't read it yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, oh, you got it there too. So, um, so I just got my copy a couple of days ago. Um, so Matt, you've been busy because this is the second book this year, isn't it right? Isn't it, is that right? So two books in one year, uh, although I do know that this, this uh, Gospel Topics essay took a long time for editing or whatever. But uh, so, Matt, go ahead and tell us what you're working on, and then uh, Newell can uh, fill us in on what he's working on next. So the Benson book just came out um, recently from the University of Utah Press. I'm very proud of that book. It's uh, um, Elder Benson was an enormously influential obviously religious leader, but also political leader. And he was a two-time presidential um, aspirant. He was a leading post-war conservative figure. He spoke at all kinds of anti-communist rallies. And so he was in the Eisenhower administration. So he, he really plays this important role, both politically and religiously. And then, um, so I did this Benson book, and then I'm working on a book now that I'm seven chapters through, it'll be 10 chapters. And both Armand and uh, before Armand passed, he read at least six of the chapters, I guess. Uh, in fact, one of the last things he did that he ever read was my draft chapter. So I'm really enormously grateful and appreciative. Newell has um, been so helpful um, along in the process. He's been reading drafts as I've gone along. And so he's been really helpful. And I'll have that book done or a draft of the book done in a couple of months. But it looks like the focus is 1930 to the present, looking at the tremendous challenges that the church faced in trying to maintain the ban, both legal, political, social. Um, also looking at how the ban effect was uh, African-Americans experienced the ban. Also look, looking at how the church's expansion abroad with this one drop policy how you tell who's black and who's not, that's always a challenge because the brethren are unwittingly baptizing people of color and ordaining them to the priesthood. Um, and there's a number of Latter-day Saints who are sort of flying below the color line. They're passing off as white when they know they have a grandparent who's from Africa. You get stuff like that. But also I think that's really instructive is um, the leadership of Spencer Kimball. And, and when he's the church president, he's, he's inherited these problems. And 
he grumbled that he couldn't go anywhere without being asked about the priesthood ban. And Harold Lee was the same way. And anyway, so one of the chapters looks at how President Kimball managed to convince the 12 that this is the right thing to do for the church, that you can't universalize the gospel message if you can't go into black countries. And so the last third of the book looks at um, the legacy of the band. And I think there's a black Latter-day Saint named Marvin Perkins. He said something, he put it really perfectly. He said that there was debris in the streets. We've got to clean up the debris. And by the debris, he meant the, the, the curse, the less valiance, all of the stuff that hadn't been repudiated with the priesthood revelation, the official declaration number two that the church put out in the summer of 1978. So anyway, it deal, the last third deals with um, uh, how they deal with the legacy of the ban and how the church will slowly start to tamp down its racial teachings that culminates in 2013. And then I'll probably finish off the book with uh, the B1 movement from a year or two ago and also the Black Lives Matter, spray painting BYU, you know, the B BYU uh, Brigham Young statute, calling mm -hmm. for the removal or the change of the Abraham Smoot building. And uh, anyway, it's a very fluent story. And it's interesting. I've had access to journals and diaries that have never been accessed before. Spencer Kimball's diaries, for example, would be one of them. I've seen Joseph Fielding Smith's papers. So really, it's, a, it's an interesting story about how a religious group tries to maintain this long-held, entrenched belief that they think is divine and of God, but yet the rest of the world is pushing back on them. And even Latter-day Saints are pushing back on them, including a slew of BYU religion professors you can imagine that in the 40s and 50s who you know they're they're saying things about the band they don't agree with it and so the brethren are, are really um faced with this uh, issue and president kimball somehow has the the courage to seek a revelation and i'll just say one last thing about revelation that i think is important for people to know that frequently the church talks about revelation as being you know the still small voice or sudden strokes of ideas that come into one's mind and that, that's all true. That, that's certainly all true. But I think that um, uh, Hubie Brown put it the best. A revelation is when we apostles, we sit around a table and we hash and rehash. Those are the words he used. We hash and rehash ideas. We debate them. Then we pray about them. And then the church president says, I feel inclined to say that this is what we're going to do. And Brown says that becomes the revelation. And so it really is... Uh, um, a moment where Spencer Kimball can get the apostles to come together with them. And this had been a long time in coming. I think a lot of the church leaders or church members just think that the revelation happened in June of 1978. That's just, that was just the tail end of the, the process. The process began in earnest when Spencer Kimball was the church president in um, when he was ordained. So anyway, um, it's a, it's an interesting story. It, there's so many moving parts to it and, I think there's a lot about this story that's never, ever been written before. And so I'm pleased to, to be able to tell this story. And Newell can, you know, talk about some of the things that he's been reading and we've been talking about the last several months, actually. <laughs> Go for it, Newell. Okay. Well, actually, I have been working on two projects. I, I finished one which has nothing to do with Mormon history. It's a, kind of a definitive history of the college at which I taught at uh, for 25 years, a history of College of the Sequoias. And it's approaching its centenary. It was one of the first junior colleges in California. And so I, I was commissioned by our, our president, current president of the college, to complete this. It had been started by a predecessor of mine, another uh, professor who had died before he was able to really finish it. And so I, 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 I picked up the baton after, after, he, after I retired. And I finished that about a year ago. I, I, I worked on that assiduously for uh, about a solid year. And that's supposed to appear in print in, in, in 2021. But the more relevant issue that I uh, just finished writing a second book, uh, which I've referred to as my pandemic uh, biography, because it was written almost entirely during the period of my confinement from March until uh, July. It's a short biography on Harold B. Lee. I entitled mm. it Harold B. Lee, 
the architect of modern Mormonism. That's my basic thesis for this book, because I feel that my, my basic argument is that Harold B. Lee has kind of been overlooked, largely because his very brief tenure as church president, which only lasted for a year and a half, and therefore his, his impact and significance has been either minimized or, or overlooked. But my basic argument is that he was an extremely seminal figure in, in, in the leadership of the church, primarily, obviously, not as president, but as a general authority from the time that he was ordained at the very young age of 42 into the uh, Council of Twelve in 1941 until his death in 1990. And even before that, in 70, his impact was very seminal because he developed the church welfare plan. And that he did that uh, before he even went into the Quorum of the Twelve during the Depression of the 1930s. That, that was one of his uh, major contributions. And his second major contribution, where I consider him an architect, is, of course, with correlation the all-important aspect of, of, of correlating and systematizing and consolidating the church organization in response to a church that was uh, expanding dramatically, both uh, in terms of population and in terms of diversity as it became more and more of an international church. And that was a process which he conceived of and, and started to promote even as early as when he was a junior apostle in the, in the 1940s, but really didn't uh, undertake with vigor until after 1960 and pushed forward over the 10-year uh, period from uh, the 15-year period from 1960 to 1974, uh, late 73, died in December 73. And that uh, those two things stand out as his major contributions, but I, but I also devote a significant section to the fact that he was also a promoter of uh, uh, Mormon conservative orthodoxy. And that conservative orthodoxy was primarily because he was a disciple of J. Reuben Clark. J. Reuben Clark was almost like a father figure to him, and he relied very much and, 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 and you know, consulted very closely with Reuben Clark uh, throughout uh, until Reuben Clark uh, death in, 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 in the early 1960s. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, so in promoting this very conservative uh, ideology on, 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 on an array of issues, I mean, he was kind of a hardliner. He was one of the hardliners uh, most conspicuously on the race issue. He was adamantly convinced that uh, blacks uh, were a divinely cursed race. I, I, he never deviated right up to the time of his death. And it was reflected most prominently in an essay that he initially gave as a radio address in 1945, uh, 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 noble uh, lineage of a, a birthright. Uh, and. Uh, it, it, it uh, argued very strongly, you know, it, it, it echoed what uh, Joseph Fielding Smith had written in uh, The Way to Perfection and other writings. And right up to the time, and, 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 and it was reprinted, it was reprinted several times as an, arti as, as, as an article in the, uh, uh, in, in, in the church news, uh, ultimately as a chapter in an anthology that was published in 1945, and then reissued shortly before his death, after he became church president, in, in, in a volume, Essentials for Successful Living, which was published in early 1973. And during his tenure, of course, a lot of the controversy over the black issue was boiling to the surface. He, he had a, a very much of a of, of, of a conflict with uh, Hubie Brown, you know, I mean, Hubie Brown and him, he really went toe to toe uh, on uh, the black issue. And I argue very strongly that uh, everybody expected Hubie or uh, Harold B. Lee, uh, you know, to live kind of the natural lifespan of his predecessors because, you know, who all lived into his, their nineties, you know. Uh, I, well, I, I think uh, actually late eighties or nineties, 
And, uh, you know, so when he became church president upon the death of, uh, of uh, Joseph Fielding Smith, uh, you know, in 1971, or, or yeah, it was se- actually uh, early, se- yeah, late 71. When he, when he became church president, it was expected, he was only in his early 70s when he became church president. And it was expected, you know, that he's going to be president for the next uh, 20 years. And I, 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 I make a case that if he had lived that long, I, I, I have doubts that the priesthood ban would have been lifted because he, he, was, uh, he was very strongly, uh, you know, he really, really didn't like what uh, Taggart had written. He didn't like what Lester Bush, I mean, he, was, uh, he thought, how did Lester Bush get a hold of these, uh, these documents? I guess it was the Benyon papers. He was just absolutely angry. Uh, you know that, uh, and that was a basis for a lot of what uh, Bush wrote about how the uh, policy evolved, and and uh, the, you know uh, he and the other hardliners, uh, you know, went went after Bush, and and uh, you know Bush was beat up pretty bad, you know, by by Lee and other hardliners, in with the subsequent publication of uh, of his uh, seminal dialogue article, and uh, uh, and and. Uh, he, he uh, and, and one of the more interesting parts, one of the interesting things I found was a correspondence that he had with a woman, a, a devout Latter-day Saint woman, whose daughter had married a black man. And uh, this devout Mormon woman uh, whom he, he had this dialogue with, uh, you know, she wrote him saying, I, I, I've, I've got this daughter of mine who married a black man who is not a member of the church and is very anguished about you know, uh, being, you know, he hasn't joined the church because he's anguished about being the fact that he, 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 uh, about being considered as a member of an accursed race, writes this letter trying to get empathy from, uh, from Hubie Brown and, or from, from, uh, Harold B. Lee. And this anguished woman is none other than the daughter of Hubie Brown. So it's Hubie Brown's granddaughter. Wow who has married a black man and he shows no empathy or no sympathy whatsoever. And he writes back to this one, what do you want me to say? I mean, he's very curt about it. And, and this is two months before he dies. He's, he dies on December 26th, 1973, just two months after he wrote this woman and kind of this very curt, letter this you know the, wow. the the daughter of hubie brown her name is jorgensen margaret <laughs> jorgensen and that's one of the documents that i found in doing my research it was thanks to uh, to matt it was in 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 a, in, a, in a collection that had been uh forwarded to be sold by moon rare bookstore you oh. know in in provo utah Mm-hmm. And uh, if it hadn't been for Matt, I wouldn't have known about this document. <laughs> Something but that me. was, and and that convinced me that 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 letter, combined with the fact that this uh, that his uh, essay on uh, affirming the blacks were an accursed race, convinced me that Hugh B, that uh, Harold B. Lee had no intention whatsoever of lifting the ban up to his dying day. Something tells me Harold B. Lee's not going to like that you got that letter. <laughs> well, I, I, I treat him in a very balanced way because I, you know, he was a product of his time. He was mm-hmm. reflective of this conservative neo-orthodoxy, uh, you know, within the larger dogma. He was a hardliner in all aspects of, mm-hmm. of his ministry. Well, this is interesting. A, I... a, very, a very prickly personality, as <laughs> Matt is well aware, too. <laughs> He had his duels with the Hearns and L. Wilkinson. They, they, they hated each other. They, they had a that and and, and old Matt's going to really detail that much more in his study. <laughs> well, that's cool. And I know Matt has mentioned that uh, previously in another interview that he's working on a a Hubie Brown uh, biography as well. Uh, I guess that one's farther on the back burner. So it'll be interesting to see the Lee. I'll have to get you both back on again. You know that. So. <laughs> Wow, this is great. Yeah, well, he's dealing with, I guess he, I'm dealing with the dark side, and I guess he's dealing with the light side, huh? <laughs> <laughs>
All right. Well, do either of you have any last thoughts before I let you guys go? I don't think so. Just uh, thanks for hosting us today, Rick. It's been a it's been a pleasure. I enjoy it as always. You you two are my favorites. How about you, Newell? Any last thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I I just uh, I've always enjoyed uh, the interviews. I I I interviewed I really enjoyed the one that you did with me a couple three years ago, and and. Uh, it, it, it's it, and it's nice that we, you had both of us on concurrently. I think it kind of made for a nice interchange. Yes, well, definitely. Well, Matt Harris and Newell Bringhurst, thank you both for uh, participating here on Gospel Tangents. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Newell. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Matt Harris and Dr. Newell Bringhurst. Matt and Newell, thanks for sitting down with me and talking about your wonderful book. I still haven't gotten my copy yet. It's on back order with Amazon, so apparently it's really popular. Um, go out and buy it now. So uh, here's a link uh, where you can buy it, uh, and it'll be just as cheap on Amazon with this link as with any other. You'll support Newell and Matt as well as Gospel Tangents, so um, check it out. In our next conversation, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Christopher Blythe. I'll let him introduce himself. I'm Christopher James Blythe. And you have a great new book. Yeah, I, I'm the author of Terrible Revolution, Latter-day Saints and the American Apocalypse, that just came out. and I'm also a research associate at the Maxwell Institute here. So, For those of you who are interested in the entire interview uncut without any interruptions, sign up at patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview for just five dollars a month also we have other tiers uh, if you'd like to subscribe on our website at gospeltangents.com click on the yellow subscribe button and you can uh, subscribe for ten dollars you can also do that on patreon and uh, get a pdf transcript we've also got uh, some other ones uh, for fifteen dollars and twenty dollars if you'd like to get those as well. If you're interested in individual transcripts, go to Amazon.com and do a search for Gospel Tangents Interview, and you can see our past interviews there in paperback form. So uh, just check out Gospel Tangents. We're always updating those. For the latest updates on Facebook, go to Facebook.com slash Gospel Tangents, and you can see our latest updates there. We're also on Twitter at Gospel Tangents. Of course, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts at a tiny URL dot com slash gospel tangents and please uh give us a five star rating uh for those of you who listen to the audio only so once again thanks for listening click here to subscribe here for a transcript and over here we've got some more of our great videos thanks again <laughs>